Welcome to The Gut Check, nutrition and gut health for active people, a podcast where we are talking functional nutrition for functional fitness and a functional you. Remember, if your gut is not functioning optimally, you are not functioning optimally. I am your host, registered dietitian and nutritionist and OCR fan, Kate Klein. You can connect with me on Facebook at The Dublin Dietitian or go to my website for additional resources, services, and the video recorded versions of these episodes at www.dublindietitian.com. That's D-U-B-L-I-N-D-I-E-T-I-T-I-A-N. As a standard disclaimer, the information provided here is for educational purposes only. While I strive to provide accurate and helpful information to my listeners and viewers, I cannot take into account individualized circumstances. This is not a substitute for personalized nutrition, health, and medical advice from a health professional. If you are ready to get your personalized plan, you can go to DublinDietitian.com and schedule a complimentary strategy session to get a game plan in place for you to hit your health and fitness goals. So let's get to it. Hello, and welcome to the research review for March. Kate here, Adventure Bound Fitness and Nutrition and the Gut Check Podcast. Uh, For those of you who've been following me on social media, you may have seen that I recently was diagnosed with tricompartmental arthritis, um, and I had some torn cartilage in my left knee. So for a time, this is kind of going to be the direction of my research, because even though I'm 40, I'm not... (laughs) ready to concede my knee health or say that this is permanent. Um, And I'm going to dive into all I can to learn more about this, um, preferably without surgery. I do believe in the body's ability to heal if we know what to do. Um, And that's actually kind of what we're going to talk about today. So briefly, there are several different forms of arthritis, the most common being rheumatoid, psoriatic, and osteoarthritis. Um, Gout is sometimes considered in this group as well, but it sort of has different things going on with it as far as causes and treatments and all that. So I'm not really going to get into that. So mostly we're just going to look at the difference here between rheumatoid and osteoarthritis briefly. So first of all, arthritis in general, let's look at the terminology. So arthro simply means joint such as arthroscopic, that's a scoping at the joint, or arthralgia is arthro and algia, which is joint and pain, and arthritis is arthro, joint, and itis, inflammation. So if you've been following things, you hear me talk a lot, a lot, a lot about inflammation, but the causes of inflammation can vary, but that doesn't mean we don't want to address it. So definitely start working on the inflammation aspect, regardless of what type of arthritis you have. Now, rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis are both autoimmune, meaning that your immune system is hyper-responsive or essentially confused, and it's attacking your tissues, your body. Our immune system is supposed to attack invaders and foreign substances, But in autoimmune, something's going on that causes it to instead turn and attack your own cells. Now, with most autoimmune issues, again, it comes to reducing inflammation, healing the gut, figuring out the microbiome, maybe looking at hormones, heavy metals, whatever it is, determining what those imbalances are going on. I've done talks about uh, calming down autoimmune issues, issues, so you can usually check those out. You know, typically I'll start with something like the Empowered Healing Program, where we do the MRT test and the diet that goes with it to put out the fires of the inflammation, and then pair that with the GI MAP stool test to see why those fires started in the first place. Um, but today the focus is not on autoimmune. Instead, I want to focus on the mechanical issues. So if you do have rheumatoid arthritis, I hope you find this interesting, but it's not really relating to the same thing. Um, we're going to be talking more about like collagen today. So with osteoarthritis, it's more a mechanical issue. It's the breakdown of the connective tissues. Osteoarthritis is again, that joint inflammation of the bone, osteo. So it's related to mechanical issues, not the immune system. It's considered more like a wear and tear on the joint um, where eventually the cartilage thins or maybe it tears or it wears away, Um, but just that cushioning wears down and isn't able to help. So now the bone sometimes is going bone on bone and that can cause the inflammation 
um, chipping away at more cartilage or meniscus or chipping away even at the bone potentially. Uh, and then of course, pain, <laughs> a lot of pain there usually. So there is a lot that can go on with this. And for athletes, first and foremost, you do want to tackle all the, what, you know, kind of the basics, the foundations, making sure you've got proper form, proper muscle balance, proper nutrition. So you are keeping that cartilage cushion as lubricated and healthy as possible. But what if it's past that? and you're dealing with some issues. You've already done that. You've got the shoes. You've worked with specific coaches. You've done corrective exercise, um, but you're still having that pain or cartilage issue. So typically, the next recommendation is physical therapy, maybe painkiller meds, maybe cortisone injections. And then what? Normally, if that's still not working, surgery is the next step. Now, there's some conflicting research on other injections, such as stem cells, um, but I haven't really gotten to dig into that. And some, some say it's like 50-50. It seems really inconsistent um, as to some of these other injections I was looking at. But as most of my work revolves around helping to heal the body, that things that conventional medicine says can't be reversed... Um, I'm not ready to, to succumb to surgery yet. I'm not ready to do stem cells and I'm not quite done giving up on this idea that I can find a way to do this myself. So I have this deep hope that I can find a way to regrow cartilage naturally. Uh, it has been my long held belief that our bodies want to heal when we know what to do. So that's what I've been looking into. And let me start with a disclaimer or two here. First, this is not going to be an episode to tell you what to do or how to fix your arthritis. So far, um, there's no conclusive research that I have yet found that says we can do this, but that doesn't mean that I'm not going to try some things as sort of my own anecdotal thing. And what we can find good research on, though, is that we can repair holes in tendons and torn tendons. And since there are many similarities in the collagen and the tissue types of cartilage tendons and ligaments, that's kind of where I'm starting. I've been diving into the tendon side first, just to understand better how that part works and maybe see how that could um, shift over to, to cartilage later. So I have been flooding my ears with podcast after podcast, YouTube video after YouTube video from Dr. Keith Barr. He is a strength and conditioning coach and researcher. He's worked with elite level athletes and was a strength and conditioning coach for some football teams. Um, now also does a lot of research, like in the lab research at UC Davis. Uh, he has 10 studies that are published on PubMed and over 200 that he's been a part of that are on Google Scholar. So he focus, uh, his focus for ages has been on athletics. And, and that's actually how he got into research, um, basically starting with trying to learn exactly how muscle mass is made, like why people on the same training program some blew up with their muscle and others did not and couldn't put on any muscle mass um, and muscle strength where the old adage used to be your strength is proportionate to the size of your muscles and learning that that's not actually true. Um, and that's where like cyclists can be very, very strong, but they need to stay very, very lean. And also a lot of like obstacle course racers, same idea. You don't want that extra weight bearing you down, but you do need that power and that strength. So that's sort of where he got into research a while ago. Um, also looking at some mechanisms of the body with endurance. But what I was mostly looking at and kind of sorting through his information on was his work with collagen-based tissues, looking for tips on cartilage regrowth. But again, most of his work really has revolved around the tendons, how to protect them from damage and how they are repairing athletes if they do tear them. So this episode, I'm going to review one of his published case studies on it. Um, but I'll also link in the show notes to all of those other research things like uh, the PubMed link that shows all of it and the one Google Scholar link that shows all like 200 plus articles. So if you feel like immersing yourself as well, you are welcome to do that. So um, today's uh, article that we're going to go over, it was published in 2019. And at the end, I'll kind of talk about some updates he's made since then. But this was sort of the first one that I came across on this. It was from the International Journal of Sports Nutrition and Exercise Metabolism. 
and it is titled Stress Relaxation and Targeted Nutrition to Treat Patellar Tendinopathy. So let's kind of dive into this. This case study outlines the rehabilitation of a professional basket player that had been diagnosed by an MRI with an injury to the center of his patellar tendon, which is, is the tendon that goes over the kneecap, basically. Um, so it kind of helps hold the kneecap in place, as well as helping those muscles have things to fire against so you can extend and uh, bend and extend the, the leg and kind of fire the quad and everything. Um, and they use specific nutrition and rehab exercises to see what they could do about this. So patellar tendinopathy is one of the most common afflictions, especially in jumping sports. And it's also actually called jumper's knee for that reason. Now, it does seem to be even worse in the, the more elite athletes. So we do speculate that the more load, the more time, the more you kind of put on this, the more likely you are to damage that tendon. In non-elite athletes, PT or patella tendinopathy is treated usually with rest, icing or cryotherapy, and sometimes, you know, they'll try to do NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, um, and they find that this is still limited success, and it can take a long time before pain goes away. Now, there's this phenomenon called stress shielding that happens with uh, injuries, including tendon injuries like PT. The idea is that to protect the weak or damaged area, the load of your movement will send the force around that injury, around that tear, instead of to it and to those tissues. Uh, kind of not exactly a, an equal analogy, but sort of the idea that if you have a hurting leg, you pull the weight off of it and you limp around, and you put more weight into the other leg. Um, and I know some athletes can see this where if you've had a longstanding injury and you've had to favor one side for a long time, even long after that injury has healed, you kind of get trained into that improper form. Like I still have a right shift when I squat. I squat and I shift a little bit to my right, even though my hips are even and I've had everything aligned, just because I had left knee issues for so, so, so long through um, college especially, and I did have knee surgery and had to do the crutches and had to do the brace. So there was still this, this idea of like shielding and protecting that. So similar kind of idea, your body is trying to protect that damaged area. So if your tendon is torn or damaged or strained, your body is going to shield that. And what that does is that results in what's considered an unloading where it doesn't put force on it to try to prevent pain. And in some ways that that's good, but that means there's a decrease in collagen content and orientation going to that injury. And we need to get those fluids and those nutrients, those proteins, that collagen and that load to the tissue to help repair it, but in the right way. So the article uh, states, the article states that one way to overcome stress shielding is to take advantage of what they call stress relaxation within the tendon. And essentially, that means that when a tendon is loaded or we put force on it or weight on it using isometric contractions or non-moving contractions like holding a wall sit, the collagen fibers can actually start to relax over time and reach what they call a steady state. And as the fibers relax, the stress shielding within the tendon also reduces and that and, and a signal then can be sent to that injured region. So they have seen what they call, um, sorry, yeah, what, so what they do is something called isometric loading protocols, where basically you're doing steady hold poses. And they have seen that that can help decrease pain in high level athletes with tendinopathies. So what they wanted to do with this case study was to see that if they can do more than just reduce pain, can they actually improve the health of the tendon if they do these specific isometric loading exercises and nutrient therapies as part of a consistent rehab program. So what about that nutrition? So <laughs> past study that they, do, they had done did suggest that supplementing with around 15 grams of collagen uh, as a gelatin with vitamin C can increase collagen synthesis. 
So improving collagen synthesis and stress shielded tendons might be important for that healing since, uh, and we don't want immobilization. That's the other thing, immobilizing a joint for even as little as 10 days has been shown to reduce tendon collagen synthesis by up to 50%. And the decline in collagen synthesis continues for over three weeks. So the idea, the old idea of rest uh, an injury, eh, we're starting to see that's not great. We, we want to move. We want to load. Now, that's not to say go out and do heavy lifting, but, you know, therapeutic rehab, physical therapy, range of motion movement does look like it's going to have some benefits and to get to it pretty much as soon as you can. Um, I think there was another research stat Dr. Barr said in one of his things saying that if you started... Um, rehab and movement and range of motion work two days after an injury, you had an improvement. You, you got back to your sport 25% faster than if you waited nine days. So we don't want to strain things. We don't want to be in pain, but we do want to keep movement going. We want those nutrients to get there. So I did research on collagen and athletes. Um, and again, I will link to the show notes the article I wrote, Collagen, Joint Health, and Athletics. Um, but just to kind of briefly review, I'm not going to go into the details that are at the beginning of that, talking about what is collagen, what's in it, how do we source it. You can check out that article. Um, and also there's a link to one of my favorite brands and the one I've been using, so Propello Life small local family owned business here. Um, there's also a discount code. I don't make money off of that. Just sharing about a brand I like and trust. Um, but let me talk about the part um, regarding collagen for athletic performance and injury prevention before we get back into the case study, because I just want to sort of set the scene with why they set this case study up the way they did. So again, they're looking at isometrics. They realize they need collagen. The collagen needs vitamin C. Um, so if you're fueling for a workout, you can get an extra boost by taking collagen roughly an hour before exercising. It takes about 40 to 60 minutes for those collagen peptides to actually peak in your blood. And its effects on the joints, tendons, and ligaments is enhanced by this working out. So normally, if you consume collagen, it, it does essentially it kind of follows the path of least resistance. It can circulate through your blood, and often it gets directed to the skin and the hair and the nails because that's where blood easily flows. We hear that a lot. A lot of people talk about collagen for aesthetics. There's not as much blood flow to your tendons, cartilage, and ligaments. So if you want to direct it to those areas, you kind of have to, to train it to, to push it that way. So Dr. Barr makes the analogy describing your body's connective tissue like a sponge. You need to wring it out and squeeze it out, and then it will be more likely to be able to absorb what is around it. So that workout, that loading, that movement, that's akin to wringing it out. And then you want to have those collagen peptides available in your blood and circulating in your system so that when it's wringing out and then you're releasing those connective tissues are more receptive to absorbing those proteins from around it. So the idea is that this can help heal and strengthen those tissues. So that's sort of the, the setup here of what we're doing or what they're doing and what we are looking at. <clears throat> so back to the case study here. They had a 21-year-old NBA player. He had experienced knee pain for about five years. He had an MRI that showed significant readings uh, in, in part of the patella or the kneecap, as well as throughout the length of the tendons, that patellar tendon. He still was drafted and he did begin regular training with the team three months after the MRI. And they did follow up MRIs about 15 months after that initial scan and then another six months after that. Now, since he was part of a team, he still had to do his regular playing schedule, playing over 50 games per season, um, at the time averaging 20, uh, 20 minutes per game. And then he also was participating in the roughly three organized practices per week, as well as the typical structured strength training program given by the team's strength and conditioning coach all while being monitored by a rehabilitation specialist, physiotherapist, and the sports medicine doctor. So he's doing a lot with that knee, you know, elite level athlete. So what they did for their rehab, they did this stress relaxation loading. 
and they were targeting the patellar tendon by doing three isometric holds. So they were doing, I believe they said in here, it was done single leg, about half extension. So they did legs, leg extension, leg presses, and a Spanish squat. And during the 18 months of rehab, they did make these harder as he got stronger by either adding more weight or increasing the duration of the hold. And they peaked at only 30 seconds. They found that the, the most work happened within 30 seconds. And after that, it was sort of a diminishing return. So um, kind of the best bang for your buck was 30 seconds at a time. And he got to that within six months and then they just upped the intensities. He only did one to three sets of two to four reps, <laughs> maxing out at 30 seconds. So these sessions only took him about uh, 10 minutes at a time. And he only did them twice a week. So they did this stress relaxation program where you stress into the isometric hold, and then you relax, and then you stress for you know up to 30 seconds, and then you relax twice a week. And that was still through the preseason, in season, and off season times. And of course, the nutrition intervention. Um, the normal dietary intake was not tracked. He didn't report any major changes. So they just did that pre-exercise, pre-movement dosing roughly an hour before the patellar tendon targeted training. He consumed 15 grams of gelatin with about 225 milligrams of vitamin C. And the results? Oh, basically he was fixed. <laughs> so the MRI images follow um, that followed at those roughly 12 and 18 months showed progressive improvements. And by the time they got to that third and final scan, they used a separate orthopedic surgeon who was unbiased and unfamiliar with the program, just kind of blinded to the whole process and showed him. And he just said the patellar tendon looked normal and healthy. Um, so, and then beyond the changes in the imaging, the self-reported pain and tenderness from the athlete himself was decreased. And by the time he got to the final scan, he was pain-free, even though he was playing over 25 minutes per game. Um, so of course, <laughs> he this athlete was totally sold on this program. And so I thought kind of a fun little note from the paper um, where they kind of said, the, the player quickly became a major advocate for the program within the team. And currently any player with symptoms of patellar or other forms of tendinopathy quickly opted into the same program or one similar based on the tendon issue. And now most members of the team perform a form of prehab using the gelatin and stress relaxation loading along with their regular training. And even though we have not quantified musculoskeletal injuries before and after the interventions, reports suggest that visits to the training room and non-contact musculoskeletal injuries within the team have dropped. Tendinopathies are, of course, multifactorial in nature. Um, yeah, so basically they're just saying this guy was such a fan of the improvements he saw that everybody else started that. And I like that they mentioned even prehab because that's absolutely true. Prehab, prehab, prehab. Do things like this to prevent injury. Don't wait till you're injured to have to rehab if you can help it. So sort of in summary, despite that old RICE recommendation, rest, ice, compress, elevate, uh, new understandings of our tendons are showing that rest may be one of the worst things we can do. And instead, we need to keep it moving within reason. You know, keep those fluids flowing, keep the proteins, vitamin C and collagen moving into those tissues. Um, Dr. Barr does note that this area of research with collagen is very new in the grand scheme of things. So there's still a lot to explore for the specifics. But even in just a few years since this case study, protocols now are already saying like, we probably don't need that big a dose of vitamin C, could be closer to just 50 milligrams instead of 225. And they're not sure if it's the collagen or gelatin itself and that entire like symbiotic blend of nutrients and makeup of that, or is it just the specific amino acids that make up the majority of collagen? So proline and glycine, could they just dose with that? Um, so far, the gelatin seems to be the best. Um, could a whey protein work? Does it really matter? Because all amino, all proteins break down to their amino acid components and then get rebuilt into the body as we need it. So certain things that they're still looking on, but for now they use collagen in their research. Um, also since then they have, seems to be able to speed up the recovery time by adding in more sessions. In some of the more recent talks, 
Dr. Barr was recommending doing those five to 10 minutes of loading two to three times per day, so long as you made sure that there were about six to eight hours between sessions, as that's how long it takes the tendons and tissues to be ready and willing to respond again to the intervention and sort of um, see that benefit. So it, it did seem like if you have to, he, he was saying, at the very least, if he had people training, like doing a team workout in the morning, then they do rehab in the evening or vice versa. Um, if you can do it before your main workout, that's good too. Because again, that way you specifically tailor where that stress is going and how that's going to affect the tissues and rehab. Um, so getting some of his athletes up to two to three times per day. Uh, he did note some cases where athletes were fully back without pain in as little as six to eight weeks for some, and then others who did things like a full-on hamstring tear, it took closer to 30 weeks, but that's still under the one to two years um, covered in this case study. Uh, so also, again, noting that this is specifically working with tendons, um, not cartilage, not ligaments. And, and what he did, he kind of talked about a middle ground. When an athlete spends the majority of their time training in high intensity, high impact sports like basketball, like tons of jumping, um, that tightens the tendons and makes them more at risk for tearing injuries. It's the isometrics that again, help soften up those tendons, relax those fibers. So it's good to balance there. If your training is a lot of high intensity, speed, blasts, power, plyo, then do some isometrics or some slow, heavy weights to, to stretch that out. But then you've got the flip side. In one podcast that he did with Cirque Sci, uh, a podcast aimed at gymnasts, acrobats, and circus performers, he actually discussed more like hypermobility or excessively loose tendons, and that had a different application. You know, if most of your work is stretching and being extra flexible or you're hypermobile and that joint is unstable, then balance that with those short hit high intensity bursts to tighten them up. So again, we, we essentially need to find that happy middle ground of strong and firm to give us power and performance and stability, but also to be flexible and malleable so it doesn't break. So I kind of think of like a rubber band. If it's all stretched out and loosey-goosey, it does no good. There's no resistance. There's no hold. But on the flip side, if it's really hard and brittle and old, it's going to crack and also kind of be useless. So we need it in the middle. We need it to be... Uh, metabolically flexible. It's not the right word, but we need it to be um, adaptable. Um, and then kind of the, the third reminder is that, again, this doesn't apply to cartilage necessarily, which also contains collagen, but does seem to have different needs. And I'm trying to find little nuggets on that. If you hear of any, pass them my way. Um, but there seems to be, instead of a need for these isometrics, he's dropped little hints that it's more about like compression, or plyo or blood restriction and release to just flood the nutrients into that area. Um, but it's not something he really dives into. So I'm trying to look at some of the research from other people at UC Davis and other applications, um, but I'm still, still looking. And of course, none of the nutrition matters if you cannot absorb it. So if you've had GI issues, protein, including collagen, is one of the hardest things to break down and digest. So that gut health still matters to being able to actually absorb and utilize these nutrients to heal. Don't just assume that that bloat or the runner's trots are just the norm, especially if you're dealing with chronic or nagging symptoms. You need nutrients, fuel, calories, proteins, you need that to heal. So if you have these chronic or nagging symptoms of pain, migraines, GI issues, you know, let's take that seriously. So I hope you found that all as fascinating as I do and as hopeful. Some really interesting research showing that once again, your body can really heal itself when we know what to do and we feed it right. So he has other case studies showing similar programs and results in rugby players and other athletes. So check out the show notes. Again, there's uh, links to lists of all of his articles. Um, and actually, I have a Spotify playlist I made of a bunch of his interviews with these different groups. Um, so check that out if you want in the show notes as well. And again, I'll also link to the article I wrote on collagen and the discount codes. So that wraps up this week's research review. Let me know your thoughts. I'd love to hear. 
and like, subscribe, follow, and share this with any, anyone you know who's dealing with tendon issues or considering knee surgery. Um, there might be some things they can try before going that route. So thank you for your support and for tuning in. Until next time, remember, if your gut is not functioning optimally, you are not functioning optimally. I'll talk to you next week.